Hello, Real Stuff listeners. Welcome back to another episode of the show. To date, with this show, we haven't brought on anyone who I would classify as an expert. Most of the show has been bringing on people to talk about their real life stories. You know, all my audience callers have come on to talk about something that's related to sex, money, or mental health, and all of our influencer or celebrity guests have kind of come on and been put in the hot seat with all these taboo topic questions. So today's episode is going to be a little bit special and a little bit different because it's our first guest that's coming onto the podcast almost as an expert in her field to answer my most pressing questions about her expertise. So I want to backtrack here about why I chose to do this episode topic. You all likely know I was diagnosed with celiac disease in 2021. I've been on a gluten-free diet for over three years now. I also had my gallbladder taken out in 2017. So my gut area and my general digestion has been through a lot over the years. Nothing is TMI for the Real Stuff podcast, so I'm gonna share this here. I don't know how many of you watched my YouTube content years back when I made a video about finding out that I was celiac, but I did open up about this in that video as well. I used to have at least one loose stool that I would categorize as diarrhea every single day. I'm talking every, every morning. I spent years of my life thinking that this was normal, and I just classified that as my morning poop. I just said to myself, this is what happens after you drink coffee. I remember I would try shifting around the order that I was drinking my coffee and eating my food. Nothing really affected it. I would just have this loose stool every day. And over the past few years, I've just learned so much about the gut. I actually spend so much of my free time listening to podcasts about health and wellness. A lot of them bring on experts and talk about various topics. And Gut Health is a podcast topic that I've listened to probably hundreds of podcasts about. So it does feel kind of surreal for me to get to do an interview with someone like this and to hopefully bring this important information about gut health and probiotics to a new audience. But I chose Tina Anderson, who's the guest on today's episode, for a specific reason. So she's the founder of the probiotic brand that I'm currently taking, which is called Just Thrive. But I also chose her because she's a badass female business owner. She and her husband, Billy, started their company together. She's really an incredible woman. She's been through many career changes and shifts. And in today's episode, she opens up about her salaries in previous fields, being a mom to three kids, working with her husband. So yes, this interview is going to be enlightening about gut health and probiotics and all the stuff that I hope you will learn about, but I know you're gonna get so many more other personal insights out of it, and I just know you're gonna love Tina. I have personally taken probiotics for years, but in this episode today, I get into why I switched to Just Thrive's spore-based probiotics. You might also know I've been getting a lot of sinus infections lately, which means I've been unfortunately on antibiotics for those sinus infections a few times, and we get into why the Just Thrive products are absolutely it for me right now. I think I shared this in the episode, but she did create a code for the Real Stuff community, which basically lets you get an entire month of their probiotics and their Just Calm product for free. I think it's 20% off a 90-day bottle, which is equivalent to a month free at justthrivehealth.com with the promo code, all caps, Real Stuff. I do say that again inside the episode. I'll also pop it into the show notes, so if you missed that, don't worry. I know you're gonna learn so much in this episode. Let me know if you liked this special edition where we bring on an expert. I would be happy to make more educational episodes in the future. I personally am an incredibly curious person. I love learning and I have received a lot of pitches from experts to come on as guests. So we're going to use today's episode as sort of a trial run. Let us know what you think and let's get into today's episode with Tina Anderson. I've heard you talk about how you've had multiple other careers before you became a business owner and founded Just Thrive. So can you sort of walk us through where you started and how it took you to here? Yeah, so I started out my career in law. I'm an attorney and I was in litigation for many years working crazy hours and um, not feeling particularly satisfied in my role as an attorney. Um, And then I started having children and I was about to have my second child and I decided that I wanted to have more of a work-life balance and be able to be home with my kids more and be around my kids more. And so I was fortunate to go into a family pharmaceutical business where I was super excited because I'm like, not only am I going to have better hours and I think I felt like I was going to be more satisfied in my career 
career because I was like, oh, I'm a part of something that's delivering life-saving medications to people. This is so exciting. But unfortunately, after being in that industry for a while, I started to notice a lot of the abuses in the industry. My husband and I were in the business together, and we started to see a lot of the overprescribing of medications, and that there was such a focus on treating symptoms, and nobody was really focusing on prevention of disease, or nobody was really focusing on maintaining our good health. And so we really didn't feel like we were doing our life's work, and so we dove into a lot of research. We um, worked with a naturopathic physician, a microbiologist, and we were, I mean, it sounds like it was so easy, but it really wasn't. But we were able to license these really, really incredible strains of London University. And that is where Just Thrive was born. And, you know, it was just, it was crazy, just everything that went into it, but really exciting. Are you comfortable talking a little bit about money? Because on this podcast, we open up, you know, I ask a lot of my guests about their salaries and how much they're making. And one thing that my followers know me for is these question boxes on my Instagram stories where I ask, you know, how old are you? Where do you live? What field do you work in? And how much money do you bring home at the end of a year? A lot of people assume that lawyers are making a lot of money. You kind of hear that it's (laughs) a field that a lot of people are unhappy, but it pays the bills. Are you comfortable Mm -hmm. sharing maybe what was like the most amount of money you were ever making as a lawyer? Um, I I mean, this was a long time ago, you know, like probably 30 years ago. Um, I I remember, I think my starting salary was around Mm 35,000 when I started. And then I think I got up to like 40 something by the time I left. I mean, it was, yeah, not a whole lot. Which I know times (laughs) have changed and maybe that was a lot more back then, but that sounds like a low paying salary. Yeah, especially for the amount of hours I was putting in. I mean, I was at the office every weekend, um, working late at night. It was it was hard, very hard. Is it the kind of role where if you had continued in it, you could have been making millions by now? I don't know, because I don't think you ever really make millions if you're doing something that you don't love mm. and are not passionate about. And I just wasn't passionate about it. I always think I would have, if I had been in corporate law, you know, where I was, I was more in like litigation, like accidents and that type of thing. And if I was in um, corporate law, I think I probably would have stayed in it much longer because I've always been super passionate about business. And then maybe I would have made, I don't know about millions, but yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. It'd be interesting, but I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of very well-paid attorneys out there, but it's also very saturated. So there's a lot of attorneys and um, some are not paid as well and some are paid way higher. When you were working in law, is that when you had very, very young babies? Um, and when I first started, I didn't have children. And then, but yes, that's when I had the young babies. I, that's why I had my first two children while I was working in law. Do you remember how much maternity leave you were given, if any, after your babies? <laughs> uh, about six weeks. Six yeah. Weeks, okay. Unpaid. Six weeks unpaid. I mean, yeah. Okay for the United States, not good for for the rest of the world, but at least you had some time. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot. I'm watching you now as this business owner and your kids are how old now? My oldest is 27, my middle is 25, and my youngest is 21. So you have these adults now who are fully Mm -hmm. functional and off on the world, independent. They don't need you or your body to survive anymore. And it makes me wonder, you know, being a 31 year old business owner who's I have a toddler and I'm pregnant with my second I'm like in the height of starting and trying to run this business while I have these babies here and you know I breastfed my first for nine months a hundred percent it feels like I've chosen to have children or rather I've chosen to start my business at kind of an inopportune time in my life because it's such a time when your kids are so needy and they need you so much. Do you feel like it was easier for you to start your business when you're having older kids? Not particularly because I do feel like when I had older kids, they were so busy with activities. All of our kids were four year, three sport athletes. They all went on to play in college and we are very, very involved in our kids' lives. So I felt like we were always at every sporting event, laptop in tow, because I was always working and all that. But I felt that 
it was, you know, yeah, in some respects during the daytime hours, yeah, they were at school. And so I was able to get things done. But then there's a lot of obligations, you know, being a mom and being home, you have to take care of the house, you have to take care of grocery shopping, there's a lot of things you have to do. Now in this day, when I was, you know, raising kids, I didn't have Instacart and all of those <laughs> wonderful things that you could do to make things easier to, but I think in some respects, it was a little bit harder to do it with the kids older because they their schedules were so intense. Whereas when the kids are little, when they're babies, you know, the, the baby schedules are basically your schedules. Yeah, I think from a schedule perspective, I agree with you because also my toddler doesn't do that many activities yet. He has a soccer class on Fridays and that's it. Right. I, I think more so what I'm thinking of is maybe the emotional side of parenting and just the shift mm -hmm. from not being a parent to being a parent and how you kind of feel a loss of identity. And it's almost like, especially given my business, which is about sharing myself, there's a lot of, well, who am I anymore? You know, who, am, I'm not the same person that people followed two years ago. And so now I'm just this new version of myself. So now I want to go back to the money stuff. You were in litigation. You said the most you ever made was like 42000 a year. Then you moved to pharmaceutical. Did that come with a pay cut or how much lower can you even go from that litigation salary. <laughs> yeah, well, it not only came with a pay, pay cut, but it also came with less hours. So I was working less hours. So I was able, when I was in that part-time capacity, I was able to be home a lot more with the kids mm -hmm. and, you know, walk them to school and, and be, and it was a part, it was definitely a part-time role at that time. So when you decide, I want to start exploring this new avenue, which ultimately turned into Just Thrive, and you think, I want to find a way to really help people at the root level, how did you even get into the situation where you were able to find a strain of probiotic that was at London University? How do you even get in the door to London University's laboratories and identify the testing that they're doing? My husband, Billy's naturopathic physician, they had been talking for years about the naturopathic physician was already doing things in the natural health space. And uh, my husband was really into like learning more about what other areas we could get into. And so, and so was I, and so we would talk about it all the time. And one day, um, his naturopathic physician said, you and Tina need to come to the office because you will not believe this. But he had been formulating some products and he had been working with a microbiologist and this microbiologist was working with London University to commercialize these strains for a certain company. Well, that company was sold. And then once that company was sold, they weren't interested in the strains anymore, which was such a blessing to us. And so they offered this opportunity to license the strains and we... It was a huge decision for us, huge decision, because we had to decide whether we were going to A, start a business, but B, we had to pay for the rights, these licensing rights to bring this product to market, bring these strains to market. And that's kind of how it was brought. I often think like, how lucky was I that I was at the right place at the right time um, and that I trusted my gut, you know, uh, no pun yeah. intended um, to, to pursue this path. Have you and Billy ever shared publicly how much it costs you to buy those strains? We have not because it's un covered under a confidentiality agreement. I figured it would be. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> the start of the company. But I have heard you say that it was your, you know, draining your life savings. Yeah, it was our life savings. Wow. Yes, it was. It was a huge. Yeah. And to do that with three kids just about to go to college time. Yeah, well, in high school, they were in high school. So yeah. I assume you had college funds all set up. You didn't pull the college funds out. No, no, I did okay. not pull the college funds. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I think I have a lot of followers who want to start a business. And of course, your business is very niche. They might not ever find a probiotic strain that they're going to license and start a probiotic brand. But what have been some of just the general lessons that you've learned as a woman who is, I'm assuming your company had to raise funding and build from the ground up. What are some things you've learned just being a woman and starting something really from scratch? Yeah, we actually did not raise any money. So everything, all of the resources were our own personal money. So um, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. Of course, we have full control and we don't have to answer to anybody. But of course, it's also very, you know, it's a huge risk you're taking in your life. So um, I love to this day that we don't have investors and that we don't have to do things just for profit. We don't have to do things just to meet revenue goals. We of course have revenue goals, but our, our we have goals, but our goals 
goals are impacting lives. That's how we try to uh, measure our goals is like impacting lives. So when you're dealing with investors, of course, that changes things. But it's also nice to have the expertise of investors. So I think that sometimes I wish when we started that we did have some investors that had some expertise. We were really green when we started. You know, I'm relatively a smart person, but I and my husband's super smart. And But we didn't know a lot about marketing at the time. We didn't know a lot about the finance aspect of launching a business. So it, a lot of it was just like learning as we went along. And um, it was a very slow go in the beginning. Um, but it also was like so fun to do something where I was helping people. And we thought, oh, well, we have these strains that are literally life changing for people. This business is going to explode. But I didn't realize like how important marketing was. I didn't realize like we had to get that message out there. And I didn't realize there was so much competition out there. So we thought we were going to like just skyrocket because we saw how these products worked with our own family members and ourselves but then okay well you know you got to get the message out there you need to have some serious marketing and you have to and you know get some PR and all that kind of thing did you come from a family that was very entrepreneurial yes my grandfather was a business owner my parents are business owners so yeah it was a very normal transition we have a lot of entrepreneurs in my family did you feel like if you can remember from your childhood did you feel like your parents instilled anything special in you? And I guess the follow up to that question is as a family owned business where you and your husband are running this business and now you have these three kids, how are you instilling, if at all, an entrepreneurial drive in them or just teaching them foundations of business at their age? Well, my parents were immigrants. And so I feel like that was huge because they just were, they were hustlers. They just knew how to, they owned buildings. They did all those different types of things to just try to like, put food on the table. And I think I just saw that, you know, you model for your children and I think they didn't realize they were modeling for us, but that's what they were doing. And I think that with my kids, I try to, um, I think it, again, it was just the modeling. I think that, you know, I'm always encouraging my kids to start their own business. Um, my daughters are both in tech sales and they, are really doing well in that. And, and I think a lot of that is because they're athletes and because they, they're they really used to being competitive. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it's because they just, it's almost like owning your own, when you're in sales, it's kind of like your destiny is in your own hands. And so I think that they've seen how hard their parents have worked in the business. And so and they want, you know, to be able to have the same type of success. And my son is still in college, but he's already, you know, part of an entrepreneur class and, and um, he had a little business during his class. So um, it, it's exciting to see them do that. I think I heard you on another podcast talk about something that your dad used to say to you repeatedly, like first thing in the morning or right before bed. Oh, every day he'd say, Tina, you're getting better and better every day in every way. And oh. uh, he would like sometimes even like put some water, like splash some water and be funny and playful. But he's he is the pillar of positivity in our family. He's still around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He still owns the business and w wants to buy another one. You know, he's he's amazing. Oh, I love that. And, uh, and my mom is like strong as she's she's the strong one in the family for sure. Is she still in business? Yep. They're in business together. Yep. Oh, wow. So you you had a model of parents working together in business. I always wonder how it would be to work with your spouse because I run my own business. My husband works from home, but for another corporation and I'm kind of constantly in a joking way, urging him to come work with me. And I, I know his skills could be put to use somehow. He's He can do financial modeling and he works in media. So I'm sure he could be helpful to my media brand, but he has no interest. He keeps saying, no, I see all these couples working together. Do you have any qualms about working with your partner or do you just love it? Yeah, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that every single day is was always it's always beautiful or but I mean, it's I love it. I mean, I don't know. I love that we have that in common, you know, it, it, that we work. It's fun to work towards something together. We always say even, you know, in the when we look back, you know, that sto the Miley Cyrus song, like it's all about the climb. Yes. I think it has been so fun for us to climb on this journey together. And I'm, we look back with such fond memories of like, you know, rushing to a trade show. One time our flight was delayed and we got to a trade show and we had to like, we couldn't set up our booth until the morning of the trade show. And it was like, we're putting things together. We're laughing about it. We were having fun, but we were stressed. I'm like sweating. But there were so many times where it was so hard 
so many times that were hard, but when you look back, it is the climb that's so much fun. And to be able to climb together has been really awesome. And, and, and I agree, I don't think it's right for everybody. I, I don't, you know, and I, I, for whatever reason, it's worked really well for us. Have you guys had to do any of that separation where you go on a date night and you say like, no talk of work right now. We're only talking about life. You know, not really. We just, not really. We don't, I'm trying to think maybe early on we were like that, you know, cause, and I feel like what would happen with us is like, he would want to talk about it. Billy would want to talk about it like at night when I am completely, that is not my time to like power through things. And he, he'd come home at lunchtime and I would try to talk about things and he wanted to just kind of escape from the work life, you know, just for lunch. And so that was about where we had to draw some boundaries, but we're pretty good about, you know, we're so involved in our kids' lives. We, our fam, we're super involved with our whole family. Like we're really close with both my parents and his parents and all of our siblings and our kids. And so we usually have lots to talk about besides our business. Are your kids, I know they all have their own jobs and do their own things, but are they in any way involved in Just Thrive? Oh, um, absolutely. As far as like, you know, they're trying to create content or do different things and or like talk to different, you know, their friends and whoever it might be. They're always promoting it in any way that they can. Um, so, but no, not in a formal role, formal sense of the role. You just reminded me when you're talking about your kids talking about the product with their friends, it was reminding me that my favorite thing about Just Thrive Probiotics that I can't stop talking to people about because I think it's so novel. Maybe you, you'll tell me if this is very common, but I think because of the survivability and because of the spore protection and the fact that it's able to withstand heat, I love that you could take the capsules and just twist them open and pour the powder into stuff that you're baking in the oven. And I've done that with brownies. I've done it with cookies. I've put the probiotics in hot, piping hot oatmeal. You know, I've given it to our toddler. I've given it to my husband, who I think I told you in the past, my husband's kind of a naysayer with some of these supplements. So Mm -hmm. he hasn't ever taken a probiotic religiously, but I can put it in his food. He doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. He doesn't taste it. And how amazing that you can bake with it. Is that common for probiotics? No, not at all. We've tested this up to 455 degrees and these strains completely survive in the presence of like that, that heat. And I did the same thing I always used to put in my son's oatmeal. Um, and it's such a great thing because they, they are tasteless, colorless and odorless. So they wouldn't even know. And some people just don't like to swallow pills at all. So you could always open the capsule and mix it with food. It's so great for kids for that reason. Yeah. You could put it in a smoothie, sprinkle it in a bowl of cereal. You really can't taste it. One question I had about the baking element because obviously when we bake stuff, it's like batch baking and then we're not eating it all at once. Is it still survivable and is it still okay to like store a baked good that has the Just Thrive probiotics in the fridge or just on your counter and eat it over the course of time? Yes, because the reason being is that they stay in their spore form until they become alive. And the only place they really become alive is in the intestines. So that's what's so great. So you could bake it and then you could you know, freeze them and then take them out of the freezer. They'll withstand the heat as well as the cold. A major theme of this show is mental health. I genuinely believe that if you don't have a healthy gut and if your gut microbiome isn't doing well, it's going to affect you in so many ways, both physically and emotionally and mentally. The gut microbiome is the totality of organisms that are living in and on us. And so about 10, 12 years ago, the Human Microbiome Project was launched by the National Institutes of Health. That study told us more about the gut than we ever knew before. Basically, what it told us is that we are 10 times more bacteria than we are human. So our bacteria is actually overpowering our human cells. And it's our gut bacteria that is dictating so much of our overall health. You know, we always think of like gas or bloating, diarrhea, constipation, acid reflux, all of those types of things as being indications that we have some gut issues going on. But what we now know is that the gut is actually responsible for so many aspects of our health, from our mood health, like our mental health, like you mentioned, um, skin health, like acne. People have acne, they have skin diseases, or they have skin rashes. Those are all indications that there's some imbalance going on in our gut. I'm hoping my audience can relate to the fact that we get such mixed messages about probiotics. You hear, you know, you got to take a probiotic. And then even my primary care doctor has told me, 
and eh, they don't really do anything, you know. Apparently, different strains, like the, the most common strain I know of is lactobacillus. And I know that's not in the Just Thrive products. It's so interesting that you said that the, the doctors say, the, the doctors I think are saying that probiotics don't do much. That's because a lot of them really don't. I mean, a lot of them really are, like I talked about, they're dying by the time they get to the intestines. And some people will find some symptomatic relief, even with dead bacteria, but they're not making a true change in the gut. So um, so sometimes when doctors say that, I'm like, okay, I'm like happy that they know about probiotics. And then I'm like, they do, I see what they're saying, but when they say they're not working, because they are, most of them are dying by the time they get to the intestines. And so the four strains that we work with are called bacillus. So they are not lactose lactobacillus like you mentioned lactobacillus in, is found in probably you know 95 percent of probiotics on the market we intentionally did not work with lactobacillus because we have a very different approach the bacillus strains that we work with are bacillus indicus bacillus clausi bacillus subtilis and bacillus coagulans these combination of four strains are they're going into your gut and they're actually helping get rid of the pathogenic bacteria in the gut and helping take our good bacteria and help bring it help it come back to life so um, if you envision a garden and a garden's been stepped on and trampled on and there's weeds growing all over that garden and you kind of compare that to your intestinal tract these strains are going in and getting rid of the weeds in the garden or at least getting rid of a lot of the weeds in the garden and helping take those plants that have been stepped on and trampled on and helping them bring them back to life. And that's what's so different about the bacillus is A, they survive, they get to the intestinal tract, they help get rid of that overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, they help bring our good bacteria back to life, and then they are actually staying there for about 21 to 28 days where they're making a true change in the gut. And frankly, we were complete disruptors when we came to the market, complete disruptors. And we had a very uphill battle, but once people started to see how well it works, that's you know kind of where we started getting some fuel behind our fire. I'm pregnant right now, and pretty much as soon as I got pregnant, I, especially the first time, I had this fear of what is safe to put in my body. Can I even take a probiotic right now? And I know a lot of my audience is pregnant or is planning to get pregnant in the future. And I know a lot of people say, you know, consult your OB, ask your OBGYN if it's okay for you. But can you just talk about the importance or lack of importance, whatever the answer is, about probiotics during pregnancy? Yes. Well, even if I just go back to like gut health during pregnancy, we have got to take care of our gut health during pregnancy. And the reason is that when you are having a child, you are passing on your gut microbiome to your child through vaginal childbirth. That is the only time you are inoculated with your gut microbiome is through vaginal childbirth. And so why I would say to take a probiotic is that a probiotic is out helping support Support your gut microbiome that you're passing on to your child. For you know FDA reasons, I have to say, you know, talk to your doctor before you take anything. Every pregnancy is different, but I cannot imagine any doctor saying that you couldn't take a probiotic or that it would be harmful, um, particularly a spore-based probiotic, which are the type of strains that we work with. But there are other things that we could do. You know, when you're pregnant, you could you know, meditate. I'm a huge believer in like calming yourself down. Your gut and your brain are very connected to each other. Like we had just talked about, and we really need to make sure that we're calming ourselves so that our brain is sending signals to our gut. And that allows for a healthier gut microbiome, you know, avoiding antibiotics, avoiding pesticides that are unfortunately sprayed all over our food supply. All these things are really helpful tools in our toolbox. Um, but a probiotic, of course, is a very, very, very powerful tool in your toolbox. I have taken antibiotics a lot in my life. And because of that, I've had to take probiotics and I've been taking probiotics for years, but there are so many different types on the shelves. There are probiotics that are kept in the refrigerator, which we could talk about why you don't recommend those. There are shelf stable probiotics. There's spore based probiotics, so many different types with all different CFUs that are available to us. As a person who recently has had chronic sinus infections, I've been taking a lot of antibiotics. This is why I personally switched to Just Thrive's probiotics because I heard you saying, it was actually on another podcast, I heard you talking about how the Just Thrive probiotics can actually survive the presence of an antibiotic and can be taken at the exact same time. Whereas sometimes if you take 
a probiotic alongside an antibiotic, it's just going to die before it gets anywhere. Yeah. So that's really the biggest difference between the spores that we work with, with Just Thrive, is their ability to survive the gastric system. The majority of probiotics on the market are very sensitive organisms. In fact, some need to be refrigerated, like you mentioned. When you think about it, a probiotic that needs to be refrigerated is actually a sign of a weak probiotic because if it can't survive the room temperature of the store shelf, how in the world would it ever survive your body temperature? Which which is 98.6 and the answer is they're not these strains are not surviving and we know that we've done we did a gastric survivability study that was one of the first studies that we did was a gastric survivability study testing the one of the highest you know most popular probiotics that is sold in um, health food stores and those strains were dying by the time they get to the intestines and we work with spore based probiotics and they have this endospore so this is not a mushroom spore but it has this endospore shell it's like a hearty like shell around the bacteria and this is not something that we've engineered these are the type of strains that are found in nature so this shell around itself allows it to survive go you know you swallow it it goes through the intestinal tract it hits the stomach and the stomach is a very acidic it's meant to be the gastric barrier. If you touched your finger on the acid in your stomach, it would burn your finger. Mm -hmm. So most probiotics are dying in that stomach acid. The spores actually keep their shell on and, keep, and that shell keeps them protected. It's not until they hit the intestines that they take their shell off and that's when they go into their live vegetative cell state. So you'll always hear like, oh, a probiotic needs to be alive to be a good probiotic. Yes. They need to be alive in the intestines. They don't need to be alive on the store shelf or you know, in the refrigerator. They need to be alive in your intestines. And so that's why we see such profound results with the product is because of this spore shell and its ability to survive the gastric system and get into the intestines and start making a change in the gut. Our probiotic strains actually have the ability to withstand the presence of an antibiotic and actually work alongside the antibiotic and helping rebuild that gut flora. You know, an antibiotic is great in terms of killing off the bad bacteria, but it is obliterating your gut microbiome. That's probably one of the biggest offenders to gut health is antibiotics that we take and then also antibiotics that are found in our food supply. So it's really exciting to have these strains that actually will you know, survive the presence of an antibiotic. So obviously you, you hear about probiotics a lot in relation to the gut. Are there other reasons why people are turning to the product? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, when you have gut imbalance going on, like I had mentioned, we think of gas, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, and those are absolutely reasons why, that telling you they have some gut dysbiosis. And yet people probably will initially come to the product because of those issues. But now that people are understanding that like, our immune system, 80% of our immune system is found in our gut lining. So if we want to support our immune system, this is the gut is where you start. Or serotonin, um, GABA, dopamine, all these really important neurotransmitters are actually being produced in our gut. People with skin issues now are coming to the product. And just like I said, overall immune health. If our immune system is not getting signals from the gut microbiome, it's not going to function. So um, we now see that so many people are just taking it just for maintenance of our health because we know that there's all these offenders to our gut health on a regular basis and we need to stay on top of those offenders. Um, but it's so fun being in this industry because, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, when they say like side effects include suicidal thoughts or bloody stools or like, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. all these awful, awful things, death even. Whereas like in our space, it's like with our product, it's like side effects, you know, people come take it because they want to get rid of their bloating, but side effects include better mood, better sleep. And, and this is all what happens when you start to take care of your gut. And, and a lot of people now are obviously are coming to the product because of pregnancy, because they know that it, if there is ever a time you're going to be taking care of your gut, it's when you're pregnant or like, well, you're trying to get pregnant. And then while you're pregnant, because you are literally passing on your microbiome to your unborn child. My audience knows that I've been going through the immunity ringer recently with a toddler who's going to school and we've just been sick for four months in a row. You know, I initially started the Just Thrive product because I was taking this antibiotic and I needed a probiotic that was going to be able to counteract it and work alongside it. And so I still haven't taken it for the 90 day course that you recommend, but I'm 
on par to get there. I would strongly recommend that people, you know, stay on it for 90 days to see all the magic happen. Some people will, you know, they may start noticing an improvement within a couple weeks, maybe a couple days even, but I would recommend that you stay on it for a while so that's when you see all the magic happen. You start seeing, you know, sleeping better or being in a better mood. Um, I have a friend who said it saved her marriage because she finally had energy. She was like having no energy and then she's like, oh my gosh, it, like how, my doctor told me, I'm, you're just getting old Older, you don't have as much energy as you used to have. And then she realized, like, when you think about it, if you start going to the bathroom more regularly, you're getting rid of toxins. You, we shouldn't be storing these toxins. And we shouldn't have constipation and we shouldn't have diarrhea because, you know, when you have diarrhea, you're depleting yourself of all these nutrients. When you have constipation, you're keeping these toxins in your system. Both are very detrimental. And, and that's the thing, like, the spores that are found in Just Thrive, they are not you know, they're not going to help like just diarrhea or just constipation. They're actually going to be helping rebalance it with whatever condition that you have and, and making it, a, you know, getting rid of that overgrowth and getting rid of, um, you know, the, the yeast overgrowth and, and other types of bacterial overgrowth in the system. I wish I had heard you on a podcast seven years ago saying that diarrhea is not normal because before my celiac diagnosis, I basically had diarrhea every day for multiple years of my life and just convinced myself that that was my morning bowel movement yeah that's what happens when you wake up and i also remember going through all these iterations in my head of maybe it happened this morning and not that morning because i had my coffee before my breakfast maybe it was because i had oatmeal instead of eggs i was trying to change yeah. all these things about my food i was having a an literal allergy to gluten i have celiac disease and it was manifesting in all these symptoms around my body, not just gut issues, but chronic migraines and fatigue in other ways. And only when I changed my diet and actually cut out the gluten did things completely transform. And that reminds me of how Just Thrive actually has a product for gluten intolerance. I know it's not like a cure for celiac disease or whatever. Maybe you could talk more about the gluten away. Yes. So the great thing about that product, and you're right, we did not create it to say, oh, take this product and now you could eat gluten. It's really meant for the accidental exposure to gluten. I'm, you know, gluten is very bad for our gut lining, for all of us, whether, you know, we think, oh, you have celiac, so you can't tolerate gluten. Really, none of us could tolerate gluten. We know that gluten is so harmful to our gut lining, which is our gut lining is so protective protective of us. And um, there's all these things that we're doing on a regular basis that's harming our gut lining, gluten being, you know, on the top of the list. So we, re well, probably below antibiotics, both are really detrimental to mm -hmm. our gut lining, but we, we try to avoid gluten as much as possible. And when you have celiac, you could be, you know, people who have really horrible things happen when they, I mean, when they have celiac and they start eating gluten. And unfortunately, when you go to a restaurant, they say gluten-free, but there was a study done that shows like over 50% of foods that are labeled gluten-free or foods out in restaurants that are claiming to be gluten-free actually have trace amounts of gluten in them. And this one enzyme in the product actually breaks down gluten to non-toxic levels of gluten when you take it. So that's um, that's our gluten away product. I will, you know, I don't have gluten intolerances. And so I will admit that I do eat pizza, you know, from time to time and I have gluten. And so I do try to take our gluten away product, but that is not the intention of it. The intention is to watch out for the anti accidental exposure of gluten. It's nice to hear you reaffirm for me just how gluten is not really quote good for anyone because ever since I went fully gluten free, I feel the effects. Obviously I had a sensitivity to it and I had celiac disease, but I've tried to talk my closest friends and family into really cutting back on the amount of gluten they're eating every day because I realized just how much it inflames people. And I actually feel like this celiac diagnosis for me has been a major blessing in disguise as difficult as it is at times. And you know, I'm the I'm not a good celiac in that I go to restaurants and I'm my mouth is watering looking at the bread on the table. And if people get pizza, I'm actually upset <laughs> that I can't partake. Mm -hmm. I know some people are like, oh, whatever. I don't even think about it. I definitely think about it. But I just know 
how positive taking gluten out has been for me and it's almost like I try to get as many of my loved ones on board or at least cutting it down because it's just so inflammatory even if you don't have an allergy to it or even if you're not totally sensitive to it it's doing things that you don't even know are happening behind the scenes yeah no I agree and it's funny because a lot of times people have intolerances to lots of different kinds of foods and I would my argument is always like once you start to heal your gut, you'll be able to introduce these types of foods back into your system. You know, people will say, oh, I, broccoli just doesn't agree with me. Well, we want broccoli to agree with you. It should agree with you, you know? And, and so I think when you start to heal your gut, you want to introduce as many kinds of foods because that is super healthy for your gut. The more diverse your microbiome is, the healthier you are. Gluten is the exception to that. I don't, even if you start having, you know, able to tolerate gluten, I would never recommend that you try to introduce that back into mm -hmm. your system. Would you ever recommend that someone like me who is really not eating gluten ever, but does eat out a lot, take the gluten away like a daily supplement? Or is it really only if you think there was some cross-contamination? I would take it before you eat out um, or, or before you cook something at home that maybe was says that was labeled gluten free. So maybe take it like 10, 15 minutes before a meal. But a lot of pe times people are taking it, you know, three times a day because they're eating out or they're, you know, even some spices have some mm. gluten in, in them. You, know, you have to even watch spices at home that you're cooking with. So yeah, it wouldn't be necessarily every day, but it would be before every meal if you're eating out. As you were talking about the flagship product, I was reminded that you also have probiotic gummies. I'm such a gummy person. You know, you said if people don't like taking pills, they can open the capsule. But like, if you like gummies, you're going to love these gummies. I've, I actually switched to the gummies. Is there any difference in terms of how many probiotics I'm getting? You're getting the same amount of probiotics. You're getting the exact same strain. The gummies just have a little bit less of a dosage of it, but it's it's the same exact strains and the same amount of gummies. The daily serving is the same. Such a nice little treat. It's like my, my candy break of the day. I get a little gummy and I know it's good for me. I, I could not believe when we launched those how it just took off. I mean, people love gummies and they are they taste so good. Yes. I mean, they taste so good. I mean, especially being pregnant. I have, I'm taking so many pills. I got the prenatals, the DHA and choline. I'm taking a lot of nausea medications right now. And so to have a gummy is, <laughs> I know there are gummy prenatals, but the brand I've chosen to take is not a gummy. So it's very nice yeah. to have a gummy probiotic. Can we talk about, you said that working on your business, that obviously there have been some highs and lows. What would you say was like the lowest time in your life? thus far the lowest time in my work life you yeah in my work life yeah you mean? yeah well yeah i know exactly when that was um we were probably about four years into the business i would say and we had literally bootstrapped it built it on our own and we had built a significant business i mean a pretty nice size business and it was still pretty much Billy and I, and we had one other person that was helping us out, but I was just overwhelmed in life. I got to a point, you know, I was taking care of everything, taking care of all of the emails that came in, all of the phone calls that came in. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable actually that we, that we did that, that, you know, I was, I'm kind of a control person. So I'm like, nobody else could do this. Nobody else could answer these science questions like I can, and nobody else could do it. So I was doing it all. And we were doing, Billy and I were pretty much built a pretty significant business on our own and, um, and raising three kids. And it was crazy. And, um, I just, I got to a point where I was so overwhelmed that I, I like couldn't answer an email. It was really, really hard. I mean, it was, and I actually, my kids still don't even know that about it. You know, I've, I've never really even shared it with them. I, I was very, I'm, I came from, you know, I mentioned that my mom is a very strong woman and I'm like, I'm a mother. I need to be strong. I need to be strong. And so I just, I felt like I couldn't even function anymore. Um, but yet I put on, you know, the act in front of my kids. So I was strong for them. And I didn't, I never wanted that part of my life to suffer. Billy and I have been married for 30, almost 31 years now. We have been blessed with a beautiful marriage. Um, he's my soulmate and we raised three amazing kids. I mentioned our family is so important to us. And that to me is my wealth. And I was like, when we started this business, I never wanted to compromise that. And so, but I also am a hard worker and, and driven and I wanted to build this business. And so kind of in that process, I kind of let myself go and um, let myself, you know, not take care of myself. So it was, it was, 
It was really, really hard. But like any challenge that happens in your life, good things come out of it. And so that was where I realized I needed to start hi hiring a team. And then that's where we had another explosion in the business when we started hiring our team and having people take over a lot of my role. And, and I laugh because the customer service women on our team, the customer service team that we have are so much better at answering questions than I was. And that's what's so funny. It's like, you think like you're the only one that could do it, but you hire people that do things better than you. And um, so that, that was a really tough time. Yeah, I can absolutely relate to feeling like you want that control. And I think sometimes what my brain tells me is that it's not even that I'm the best at doing something, but that it's just easier to do it than to try to teach mm -hmm. someone what I've been doing. You know, I was operating for a really long time with just a virtual assistant and running my business. I recently hired a full-time content producer who is on this call, actually. She's muted. And it's been the best. It has totally, even just the day she started, I felt this lightness and I was able to share all these tasks with her and the speed that she's working at and the type of content she's turning out is a lot of the quality is better than I could have done it because I have all these other things going on. What was your zone of genius? Was it being out and meeting people? Yep, it was exactly that. Like the being out, meeting people, building relationships. That's kind of my where I love to be and I love relationships. I love people. I love creating true friendships. And that's what's been fun about the industry is I've just met some of my closest friends. Like when I started this business, I was 45 and I'm like, oh, you know, I kind of have my friends. I'm, I'm super close with my family. I have my really good friends in the neighborhood and I have my church friends. I'm super involved in my community. But now I met all these other great friends. So anyway, I think networking and maintaining relationships with people has been I, I never I thought that it was like a genius zone, but it really, I, and now that I look back, I realize that having those good relationships with people have been, has been really beneficial to our business. One question I love asking people, I feel like I could watch videos of people sharing this all day, is what does your typical weekday morning routine look like in terms of just getting up, caring for yourself and setting yourself up for a good day. Um, so I wake up and I take, I get some lemon water and I start my day with that. And then I do my affirmations. I have daily affirmations that I say, I look at myself in the mirror. You say what <laughs> your dad taught you. I say what my dad taught me, what he woke me up every morning saying that I'm getting better and better every day in every way. I have several affirmations, some that are business, some that are personal, some that are health focused, whatever it might be. So I have those. And then I do, I go out for a walk. I walk outside almost every day, whether, and you know, I mentioned I lived in Chicago area. So I doesn't matter if it's cold. And the only time I don't walk outside is if it's like dangerously icy or dangerously cold. And yeah, that's, I, I'm, I journal at night. So in the morning, I don't journal. I usually journal at night. That's pretty much my daily routine. What do you do on your walks? I listen to podcasts usually. And sometimes I listen to music. Um, it depends on what my mood, I'd probably say it used to be like music and now it's kind of like 75% podcast, 25% music. And as a person running this business, I'm sure you're super busy. I'm sure you're traveling a lot, trying to expand the company. How do you prioritize doing things just for yourself? Like those typical health and wellness things. I don't know what rituals or routines you have that you do regularly, but how do you find the time and how do you make sure that that gets done for yourself? Yeah. Oh, it, it, that has not been an easy <laughs> journey to do that. But when I was going through that hard time, I started to get massages. That has been a wellness routine that I have been pretty strict about. I usually, I mean, in the beginning, I was literally going every week and then I changed it to like every other week. And now I'm up like every three to four weeks, I try to go. For whatever reason, it really helps me quite a bit just to unwind. And I am a huge fan of having, like I have, that's part of what I give our team. Like part of our team is I say to them, you guys, I needed a massage. They all work so hard. And I'm like, you guys need to get a massage. So that's part of the benefits that they get is a monthly massage. Oh man, I'm moving to just thrive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. They work really hard. So <laughs> yeah, I figured, you know what, if I, you know, it's the same thing. Like I, I try to treat them the same way I would want to be treated. And you know, I like, I'm always like, Oh, if you need to go to your kid's game, you know, we'd never missed our kid's game. So we wouldn't expect them to. So, but yeah, taking care of myself. A, a massage has been really important. Well, you guys make such an incredible power team and thank you, <laughs> thank you for your products because they're very useful to me personally. And I know 
a lot of people have a lot of gut imbalances and a lot of gut issues. And so I'm hoping people will try it out. And I do want to call out while we're still on here that because you really promote the 90 day bottle, you know, for people to really start and give it those three months to see what happens. We are giving the listeners of the Real Stuff podcast 20% off a 90 day bottle and they can get that at justthrivehealth.com using the promo code Real Stuff all caps, which basically getting 20% off a 90 day bottle is kind of like getting a whole month of the product for free, correct? Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Exactly. One final question for you, because I've heard you on a lot of podcasts and you're such a well-spoken businesswoman and you know, you know what to say about your company. And I, I felt like just from listening to a few podcasts of you in the past, which I've been hearing you on podcasts for years, by the way. I feel like I know a decent amount about you. Can you tell us something that people don't know? Hmm, okay. (laughs) One thing that's kind of a fun fact about me is that I'm Serbian. So I mentioned that my parents are immigrants. They came here from Serbia. And um, being Serbian is a huge part of my life. My husband is also Serbian. And Billy and I met at a Serbian event. And it's just a fun part of our life. And the Serbian community in America is really tight and close knit. It's just, it, it, you know, we have a lot of close friends that are Serbian um, and we, we love the Serbian community. And I, I listen to, that's kind of a funny fact. That's actually a funny fact. We, Billy and I will listen to Serbian music a lot on a Friday night with a glass of wine. And um, I love to like dance Serbian. Well, thank kind you for sharing that with us. Is there a big Serbian population in Chicago? There is. Yes. Very huge population in Chicago. Very nice. Thank you so much for coming on. One thing I want to call out for people, Tina and I had spoken ahead of time and we had decided that sex was off the table for this chat because your daughters (laughs) apparently might listen to this podcast. So for (laughs) Tina's daughters, you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Or or my son even more so. Could you imagine? Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And you know, we always say on the show, there can be boundaries. I just want to know why, you know, what is the boundary and why do you have it in place? And in your case, Sex, because my kids are listening. Done. No more questions. Signed, sealed, delivered. <laughs> Thank you. Lucy. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to The Real Stuff. I'm Lucy Fink. Don't forget to follow the show on social media at The Real Stuff Pod. And if you're liking these episodes, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It helps the show so much. And if you're feeling called to come on the show, visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us your story. We'll see you next week for another intimate conversation on The Real Stuff.